And if you're white in hip hop, you have to contribute to black culture in some sort of fashion. You can't come into this from the vessel of hip hop and use the clothes and the language and the music and then go off and start doing something. Are oh, you talking about Post Malone? You know what? This is the thing is I remember when I first started there was this whole like white rappers can't like white rappers. It's like this rule. Oh, yeah. yeah I, I promoted that, that for 20 years. Like, no, no, no. And, and it was true. It was kind of uh, like when, when you know, it is how it was. But you get, that shit's got to go. Yep. From the moment they enter the music industry, white rappers have always had to deal with animosity from the culture. Suddenly, the minority for the first time in their lives, Caucasian MCs have always been held to unrealistic standards by some who'll never accept them, while in other cases, their own attempts to make amends for succeeding in the game has always prevented them from being taken seriously long enough to establish themselves, make a significant impact, and leave behind a lasting legacy. From the days where Eminem was challenging everyone from Cage to Fred Durst and ICP, through to the modern day when Shady has taken issue with the likes of NF and Token, white rappers have always had a tendency to beef with each other. Recently, we've seen the cannibalistic tradition re-enter the news cycle, with MGK firing some strays at Jack Harlow. Seemingly stemming from Jack's bars on They Don't Love It, MGK's response came in the form of a freestyle, spitting, see why they call you Jackman, you Jackman's whole swag. The twin forces of the media and the internet were, as always, quick to hype the beef, and before long, the issue was addressed during Jack's appearance on Rap Radar. But you did say you're the hardest white boy since Eminem, and then That's right. <laughs> certain people got in their feelings. Are you gonna clap back at him lyrically? How do you take it then? I guess you just <laughs> take it. I don't know. <laughs> Everyone is entitled to their opinion, and I feel great about what I said, and I feel great about the reaction. While Jack held this situation with his characteristic nonchalance, there's plenty of examples where that sort of questioning from a media figure would have been enough for a full feud. And if he did, then Jack would have fallen into a similar trap in which white rappers square off against one another. As up until this point, it seems like they're simply incapable of coexisting, or at the very least, haven't been granted permission to accept each other's presence in the game. And while we could go through and exhaustively list every single beef that's ever taken place between white artists and hip hop, we're more interested in establishing why they happen so frequently and where the common threads lie. For starters, we have self preservation and competitiveness. No other form of entertainment is so geared towards confrontationally asserting yourself quite like hip hop. And given that white rappers are already burdened with the notion that they're guests within the genre, it's only natural that this idea of taking on anyone who might be hovering near your market share would be addressed. As a result, verbal jabs such as those that MGK sent to Jack Harlow's direction have been a regular thing in white on white rap. And the more of them you add to the mix, the more volatile things get. Here, we have a track such as Dilated People's Ears Drum Pop remix, which simultaneously sparked two beefs. The story goes that it was a throwaway bar that was misinterpreted that led to his longtime feud with Eminem. With Everlast spitting, cock my hammer, spit a comet like Haley, I'll buck a 380 on ones that act shady. This was enough for Slim to assume that he was being sent for, and before long, he responded with venom on diss tracks like I Remember and Quitter. On I Remember, Eminem even goes as far as to admit that the two of them trying to exist within the same cramped space as white artists could have led to the friction. Spitting, remember Sway and Tech when I came up and sat beside you? I started rhyming and you left the room and didn't say goodbye or nothing. Like you mad that someone else was white and tried to rhyme or something. But, according to Everlast, the whole thing was actually a miscommunication, and here we can see how the intensified spotlight of white rappers meant that Shady had no other option but to respond. I say something about Haley's comment at that. I didn't know his daughter's name was Haley, but he got very upset about that mm -hmm. part, and then that got exposed that he knew so much about, or he was so upset that he thought I had said something about his daughter that I, I used that in the diss, the second diss. He was about to go to jail or something, and I said, I'll look in on your kid. I wouldn't have done that at this age as a parent. Right. Two dogs, I wouldn't. On Quitter, Eminem chose to expand his targets, opting for a scattergun approach, which also meant that he took aim at dilated peoples for giving Everlast a platform in the first place. In doing so, it meant that he inherited a beef with another white rapper and producer in evidence. During a visit to the People's Party with Talib Kweli, Evidence was happy to explain that even though he'd met M before and everything had been cordial, they suddenly had no choice but to go to war. Getting dissed by Eminem in the prime of his career it was not cool at all. <laughs> the real Slim Shady was out. He, right. he was on over the top of the world. There was a coffee shop I used to go to in the morning and the girl looked at me one day and, and just started laughing in my face wow. and she was like 
what are you going to do? That's what she told me. With Shady's power seemingly capable of destroying his career, Ev understood that taking M's provocations lying down wasn't an option. The resulting diss track, Searching for Bobby Fischer, saw him shade Eminem and divulge personal details that he'd gotten from someone he knew in Detroit. So I went back and wrote a rap against him, and mm -hmm. whether you like it, don't like it, or anything in between, I got respect. Then he hit me again with another diss, and it wasn't that good. He didn't have much on me. Eventually, Paul and I are cool. Right. I seen Eminem backstage at a festival one time with Alchemist, you know, a little, there was a little, like, we're cool. I get played on Shade 4 or 5. Right. Nothing really happened. I got to get respect for not backing down mm -hmm. to somebody who was yes. Godzilla, and then that was it. Compelled to fight one another, even when the personal animosity was more imaginary than anything else, this is the same exact mentality that had MGK and G-Eazy jostling for image rights almost two decades later. Two rappers that resided in the same area between getting play from the mainstream pop charts while generally getting respect from hip-hop diehards, MGK and G-Eazy had moved in similar circles for years with little to no issues. But that would all change with an unsavory funk flex freestyle from MGK, in which he rallied against G-Eazy for everything from stealing his look to allegedly sleeping with his one-time girlfriend, Halsey. Before long, MGK's first sparring match with the white rapper would soon be eclipsed by getting coaxed into the ring with Eminem. Whoever you thought won, Rap Devil and Killshot represent just another case of white MCs misinterpreting one another's behavior as something more antagonistic than it is and responding with venom. After all, in the very same tweet that allegedly sparked the incident, MGK called Eminem the king. Despite this, he was soon blacklisted from Shade 45. Eminem's radio station. And well, the rest is history. With their perpetual conflict, the media has thoroughly enjoyed every moment of it. During a guest appearance on Howard Stern's show, Howard pointed out the striking similarities in their upbringings and backgrounds, suggesting that it was ironic for them to be feuding in the first place. I mean, was Eminem a hero to you? Yeah, for sure. The guy's a great rapper. Does it personally pain you that you have this feud with this guy? I'm like asleep in my tour bus. This guy drops an album with like three songs talking about me. I said what I said and respect the fight. That's it. The guy down the street has money. This fool has wealth beyond. I'm all about putting my arm around people. I'm not with like doing this to people. So I, I, I can't relate. The last thing I want to ever be is an angry legend. As much of an icon as Howard is in this field, He's clearly naive about hip hop, as when it comes to white rappers, the shared experience of coming up in this game is actually the issue. Throughout history, white rappers who are on the come up have a tendency to try to prove that they're in it for the right reasons, while saying that others are there to profit from the culture. Just like we often see, this too goes all the way back to Shady rallying against Vanilla Ice and Milkbone in 1999, as in a famous interview, he doubled down on dissing them, saying, I didn't just want to be thrown out there, you know what I mean? Like a milk bone or like vanilla ice and just like try to start at the top or whatever. I want that foundation. I want the respect. I, I ain't in this for the money. I'm in it for the respect. I'm in it for like just for somebody to come up and say, Eminem, you're dope. A now familiar move in the white rapper's playbook, a man who's always struggled to get his respect in the game. Russ is one man who took issue with how Post came into the game, believing that he used rap aesthetics as a springboard to fame. But as a white rapper always will in these situations, he used the example of Malone to depict how he was different from the other white rappers. And if you're white in hip hop, you have to contribute to black culture in some sort of fashion. Otherwise, you are simply repeating history by coming in to black culture, using that as a medium to steal and profit for self. You can't come into this from the vessel of hip hop and use the clothes and the language and the music and then go off and start doing something. Are you Very talking good. about Post Malone? I think that's a fair example. You come in with braids and golds to the point people are thinking you're mixed and now you drink Bud Light and wear cowboy boots. You used it to propel yourself to the forefront and then you reverted back to who you really were. I feel like I do hip hop justice. I don't, I don't make a mockery of it. I don't portray any negative stereotypes. I don't feed into it. Painted as a need to police themselves and condemn those who break hip hop's codes, there is an honorable intention to be taken from this. But where this might be the most admirable reason to take issue with a fellow Caucasian in hip hop, there is one other common cause of the beast that can't be ignored. 
And that's the nature of the music industry. Where Yellow Wolf's Bloody Sunday Freestyle took aim at Post Malone, g Easy, and MGK to generate buzz for his forthcoming album, others were incentivized by in different ways. Here we have R.A. the Rugged, an underground legend that was once headhunted by a record label purely to diss Eminem and capitalize on his hype. Yeah, man, when M blew up, I had every label on the planet calling me to do a diss record for us, do a diss record, diss Eminem. You're calling White Boy to diss White Boy. I think Suge got uh, Milk Bone to do a diss record to M. Right. Like they, they would reach out to White Boy rappers. Like Priority was like, look, you're the only White Boy that can do it. You're better than M. You'll destroy M. R.A. ultimately turned them down and chose to share this story to the world. But if he actually rejected their offer and was free to talk about it, it makes you wonder how many other feuds between white rappers may have been manufactured by a record label getting in their air. Alongside the major labels understanding the potential revenue from white on white beef, others have witnessed the media try to drive a wedge between them by pitting otherwise cordial MCs against each other. Unfortunately, this isn't a half-baked theory and was actually epitomized during a conversation between Mac Miller and Hot 97's Ebro. You know, people always, oh, what do you think about Macklemore? Because he's killing it now. I'm like, nah, he, he's, yeah, he's killing, killing it. it. Yeah, That's good. awesome. And he's a good dude, too. That's fine. Two things I'd like to do. One, Macklemore. I don't know him, right? And I'm cool <laughs> with Ack Iller right now. You're going against everything that I he just, just said. It. We don't have to say Macklemore right. to like Mac Miller. Right. It can just be cool. Yeah, it's it can fine. Just be cool. There's no I, issue. I'm going to tell you right now, there's plenty of beef between black rappers. I need white rapper beef. Oh, but since white rappers were traditionally the minority in hip hop, they had the most beef. It was like quiet, like, sincere. No, I, don't, I, don't, I just don't want him to win because I am the white rapper. There's only right. so many there white can, rappers.